morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. That is absolutely wonderful. Welcome home. We are so delighted that each one of you are here today. This is a very, very special day in the life of Trinity on the Hill as we celebrate our God and Country program this afternoon at 1 o'clock. You'll be hearing more about that later on today. But we want to say a special welcome to each one this morning, particularly if this is your first time to be here. We are so glad and honored that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. I want to ask if you would to please take the registration books at the end of the pew. If you would take just a few moments to um, sign in your uh, registration with us today. Also, if you have a prayer request to share with us, we would be honored to pray for that request and for you this week. Also want to remind you that today there is no children's church today, but there is a uh, children's sermon. And uh, so at that time, the children will be coming to the front. Once again, we are so glad and honored that you're here this morning. It's our prayer and our hope that God will be honored in all that we do today. May the name of Jesus Christ be praised this morning. This morning, our theme for the worship is set in our call to worship. I'll ask you to stand as you're able as we read responsively the news about the kingdom of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their place in the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Turn with us now to number 698. We're going to sing a hymn called God of the Ages, but we're, it was originally written with God of our fathers. And so we're going to sing it as it was writ originally written because of today being our uh, patriotic service. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand, number 698.
amen. amen. Let us join together. Our affirmation of faith is printed in the bulletin. After we say our affirmation, our hymn of response will be the last verse of uh, My Country Tis of Thee. We believe that God created the earth and that everything in the earth belongs to God. We believe that God has given us this nation and blessed us with freedom and plenty. We believe that freedom and plenty carry a certain responsibilities that we are to love justice and mercy and walk humbly with our God, that we are to share our gifts with those who have less, both in this nation and in other nations, and that we are to live with gratitude, thanking God for the divine favor we have received. We believe, therefore, that we cannot fully celebrate our independence without remembering at the same time our dependence upon God and exalting God's name among the nations. There is no power like the power of God. Glory be to God. Amen. be seated as we go into our morning prayer time. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. This kneeler is open if you would like to come spend some time here on your knees. Let's sing together. Most gracious God, that is our prayer, that your Holy Spirit will fall afresh upon us this day. Move us to a place where, Lord, we may see you face to face and hear your voice speak to us. Lord, we love you as we bow before you and come before your presence. For, Lord, in your word you tell us that where two or more gather in your name, you are there also. May we always, Lord, remember your eternal presence in our midst as we seek to be formed and transformed into your likeness as children of the living God. O oh God, for those of us worshiping, worshiping together this day, we pray for your healing hand to touch those dealing with brokenness in body, mind, or spirit. Pour out your power, our Lord, that they may know your miraculous touch in the powerful name of Jesus. We pray for your eternal light, O Lord, and for giving grace to fall upon those who are living in the midst of a dark cloud and in a life of regret. Set them free, O Lord, we pray, for we know that yours is the victory. Praise be to God. 
We pray, O oh Lord, for your redeeming power to bring all of us to that place of wholeness, forgetting what is in the past and looking toward the goal for which we have been created. May it be so, O oh Lord, may it be so. Heavenly Father, we join together today to pray for all of our mission partners. They are such a vital part of this congregation. Those serving throughout Augusta, serving across our nation, and for our mission partners serving across the ocean in Belize, Honduras, Jamaica, India, Togo, and Venezuela. Lord, we know that they all re represent such different mission fields, and yet, Lord, we know that they are faithfully sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the billions of people around the world who still do not know you. You are our hope and our salvation. We pray that you will bless each mission partner, protect them and their families as they faithfully serve you and preach your good news. Oh God, for our nation, we profess that we are called to be one nation under one God, and you are our God, and we are your people in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Heal our land, Lord. We desperately need you. Your word calls us to humble ourselves and pray and to seek your face and to turn from our wicked ways, and if we faithfully do that, you will hear from heaven and will forgive our sin, and will heal our land. Oh, Lord, we seek your face, and we cry out for your Holy Spirit to heal our land. We need you, Lord. We need you in our churches. We need you in our nation. We pray that you will empower our politicians, our community leaders, our school teachers and administrators, all who know you personally, that they may be bold and confident in serving you wherever they are called to lead. For those who are serving in the military and for our men and women serving in law enforcement, oh God, we pray that you will protect them as they defend the rights of freedom we are so blessed to enjoy in this nation. Lord, we thank you for their sacrifice. Bless them, we pray. For all of us, may we stand firm in proclaiming that we are citizens first and foremost of your kingdom, O Lord. Praise be to you, O God. And in that spirit, we pray and commit to live the prayer that you have taught us and all of your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 437. I love this hymn. It's perfect for today, for Mike's message that he's going to bring us. It reminds us that as much as we love this country, that we are citizens of God's kingdom. Let's stand as we sing all three verses.
as our children come down, greet each other in the name of Christ. that you chose to worship with us today. You're an important part of this congregation. Today we celebrate God and country. And as Dr. Cash will be preaching in a little while about the importance of citizenship in God's kingdom, which is first and foremost where we experience hope and joy. And we are glad that you can share that with us. God bless you. Let's join Dr. Cash and the children. Amen. Have you kind of noticed that people are wearing a specific color today? Have you noticed a lot of red and white and blue? What's that all about? Fourth of July, of course, as we celebrate our nation. And red, white, and blue happens to be the color of what? The flag, the flag of the United States of America. And right over there, you'll see the flag in the corner. And then you'll see, these are called buntings. Buntings, and it's got the red, white, and blue. Now, have you ever learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? You did. Okay, everybody's got that down, right? Very good. We're going to do that this afternoon at 1 o'clock at our God and Country celebration. But I bet you didn't know that we have another kind of flag in our sanctuary. Have you ever seen this flag? You have. What kind of flag is this? It's the Christian flag, of course. And it's also red, white, and blue. How funny is that? This was started about 100 years ago in a Sunday school class where they thought, well, if we have an American flag, we should have a church flag that represents the kingdom of Jesus Christ. They developed a flag that has the white, which is the purity of Jesus. We have the blue, which is the passion of Jesus, or sometimes it's called the water of baptism. And then there's the cross at the top, and that represents Jesus Christ, and the red color represents his blood shed on the cross for him. And so this is a church flag that's been around for about 100 years, and we even have a pledge to the Christian flag that Miss Lillian has used many times in children's church and vacation Bible school. And it goes like this. I want you to repeat after me if you can, okay? I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior crucified and risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Isn't that neat? We have a Christian flag. You've learned something today, haven't you? Or maybe, did, did you already know this? Yeah, well, you're so smart. I mean, you really are. I hope you'll come back today at 1 o'clock when we're going to be singing our patriotic songs to the flag of the United States of America. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for your kingdom that we are all made citizens of through Jesus Christ, by his grace through the cross. We thank you for our country as well, and we pray for our country to always be strong and to stand for that which is right and holy. And help us, Lord, as a nation, when we do it wrong, to stop and do it right, just as we ask for our own lives when we do something wrong. Bless us this day so we can continue to be a blessing to everyone in this world. Praying all this in Jesus' name and God's children said, Amen. You'll return to your parents sitting in the pews. Moms and dads, if you need to stand up and they can find you, please be sure you do that. As we come to our tithes and offerings today, it's always good to think of the blessings that have come our way. And it always seems to me around the July the 4th holiday, especially as we celebrate God and country today, 
we are reminded of the immense blessings that comes from simply being born in this great nation or for those who have come and become naturalized citizens. It dawned on me this week that in many countries that have adopted the church as its state church, that the tithes and offerings for the church are received through the taxes of that country. It's the way it started way back around uh, 300 A.D., and a, a few countries still do that. How would you like your tithes to be uh, collected by the Internal Revenue Service? Would, is that something that you would, uh, yeah, me either, me neither. Because I believe that when we offer our tithes and gifts, it's more than just a duty, an obligation. It is a spirit of thanksgiving and generosity, recognizing that God has blessed us so deeply. And sometimes when we give these tithes and gifts, it never comes back to us. It's given throughout this community and across the world so people can be helped and guided to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. To me, the state can't do that. Only the church can do that. So with that in mind, let us receive the tithes and gifts today with the generosity of our hearts. Ushers, if you'll come forward, let us pray together. Gracious and holy God, indeed, take our gifts and, and our offerings, even take our lives and use them to the advancement of the kingdom of Christ here on earth, so that his name might be lifted up and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Praying all this in his name and God's people said, Amen. I'm going to take a moment of personal pleasure here and introduce my 93-year-old dear mom who came. Mom, stand up. Stand up, yes. Yeah. It's been a number of years since mom and dad have been able to come to Trinity. Dad wasn't able to come, but uh, she brought with her my sister, Brenda Adams, and her husband, Reverend Don Adams, and uh, it really means a lot for y'all to be here today. Andy and Fabio have done it again. Uh, this arrangement just really blessed us at early service. Um, I think one of uh, America's favorite hymns, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. I love the way they've arranged it because it has both the angst, the, the, the difficulties that this nation uh, was born in, as well as all of the angst through all of these years. And, uh, but it ends in such a fabulous way that gives us hope uh, for this kingdom of God.
may be seated. Our anthem is God Bless America, and at some point I'm going to turn and ask you to sing along with us. I think they're leaving, aren't they? We're going to allow our choir to be dismissed. Uh, they have a chance to go and eat at the barbecue uh, before they come in at 12.30 and practice for the one o'clock concert. Now, if you're wanting a barbecue ticket, I have bad news and worse news. There are no tickets left, but I hear there is some scalping going on. <laughs> kind of like the master's golf tickets. However, if you are scalping barbecue tickets, uh, that requires a 20% tithe back to the church. <laughs> just saying, just saying. Uh, today, we're also going to offer some um, golf cart transportation up the hill, down the hill, if you are going to be going that direction. If not, we hope you'll just kind of sit in the sanctuary and wait till 1 o'clock to rolls around and have a wonderful time at this God in Country uh, concert uh, as you were just singing with the choir, there's going to be several opportunities for you to do that, especially if you served in one of the military branches as we sing each one of those uh, theme songs. Uh, and today, Danny's found a new um, 
what do you, what'd you call arrangement of the military branches. And this is the perfect one because it puts the Air Force first. <laughs> now, I was never in the Air Force, but my son-in-law is currently serving in the Air Force, and I just think that's proper. I'm, I'm sorry, John, I just had to say that. <laughs> but Falk will appreciate that wherever, where's Falk today? Is he, I think he was here at our earlier service. Today we're going to be reading the scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, it's a subject of citizenship which is a proper subject uh, for this coming week. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 11. As you're able, let us stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, now that's all of us, uh, and in, when this particular scripture was written, it was 99% of the whole world. We are Gentiles, which means we're not Jewish. That's what it means. So you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcised, which is done to the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise you were without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself is our peace, who, may, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through Christ we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Let us trust the Holy Spirit to awaken our curiosity, to inspire our understanding, and to transform our behavior in the reading of this holy word. You may be seated. One of the narrations that you will hear this afternoon in our God and Country presentation makes the following statement concerning the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence of 1776. It goes like this. As each man signed his name to the Declaration, he knew that this was essentially an act of treason. Each was fully aware that he would likely be executed for signing his name to such a decree. Yet, they stood together and mutually pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Is that not high-test citizenship? High-test citizenship. Now, about this time of year, the Internet runs quite a popular essay concerning the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, making some very grandiose claims about how much they suffered and how they died. But as we look at the facts behind this, we find that it's a little bit on the exaggerated side, but really, they did lose much in their lives, loved ones, sons, fortunes, and homes. This history becomes very personal to those of us who live in Augusta because after the revolution, Augusta became the temporary capital of the state of Georgia. And many of its leaders moved here in order to establish that government. One of those people was a signer of the Declaration of Independence named George Walton. You might know him as Walton Way as you came to church this morning. His home is down on 13th and Walton Way still to today called Meadow Garden, and you can visit there. 
He was also the founder of Richmond Academy and Franklin College, which later became the University of Georgia. We came that close to being bulldogs, people. <laughs> but that's another sermon altogether. George Walton was indeed captured as he led the militia in the Battle of Savannah in December of 1778. And along with three other signers from the state of South Carolina, they were indeed prisoners of war during this uh, Revolutionary War. They were not so much tortured because they signed the Declaration as they were prisoners of war and suffered the abuse that so often happens with those who are prisoners of war. And so even though the internet may have exaggerated somewhat, we still understand that these 56 men indeed risked so much and lost so much. Again, a high test of citizenship. I was curious this week about this issue of citizenship and began to wonder, well, how do you become a citizen of the United States? Most of us, almost every one of us, were born into our citizenship. It's that easy. We were born into it. But you know, in the beginning, they didn't really have any rules about who could be a citizen of the United States. It wasn't until the Constitution was written, which was almost 10 years later, that a provision was put forth that those who were born on the soil would be citizens, and those whose father lived in the United States, and if they were born in another country and could prove their father who lived in the United States, they could be then also citizens. It wasn't until after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment is signed, establishing the, the rules for how we become citizens of the United States of America. About a decade ago, one of the members of our church became a naturalized citizen. We were kind of involved in the process that he went through, and, and it was quite enlightening to see the things required of him to become a citizen with us who simply were born into it. The first thing he had to do was to renounce his allegiance to his birth nation. Now, it's curious about people who have dual citizenship. How do you do that and still uh, renounce your allegiance? Well, you renounce your allegiance to your birth nation, but you can keep your citizenship. I don't know how that works, but that's the way it works. But as you give your allegiance to the United States, in case the two countries ever were at war, you couldn't fight against us. So usually dual citizenship only goes to those countries that we think, well, we'll never fight those folks. You know, places like Canada, things of that nature. The second thing that you have to do to become a naturalized citizen is you have to study the history and the form of government and our judicial system and take a test. Now, most of us did this when we were in the eighth grade. That's when it happened for myself. It was the eighth grade civic class taught by Coach Bo Clark. A football coach. So you can see how a high priority that was for our high school. But uh, I learned a lot about government and the judicial system. It was also the, the time that we signed up for our social security number. It just so happens that my wife now, Connie, was in that class. Our social security numbers are only two digits off. How many of you husbands can, can say that you're, you know your spouse's social security number. I can do that. <laughs> I'm not going to give it on air right now, so I you can test me a little bit later. The third thing you had to do is you have to be someone of good moral character. And I think that's important for us to understand that those who become naturalized citizens, you know, can't be the ones with the long prison terms. And fourth, they have to be able to read and write and speak English. <laughs> That's probably why our 10th grade teacher told us that we were not citizens of the United States because we, she said we were really bad at English grammar. And I've been holding that up pretty long, so I appreciate everybody's corrections for me after the sermon's over. The temptation, though, for those of us who were born into our citizenship is to enjoy the fruits of citizenship without tending the tree of liberty. In fact, that's what Thomas Jefferson called it, tending the tree of liberty, even to the point of shedding the blood of patriots. 
In the 40s and 50s, Harry Emerson Fostick preached a sermon entitled, Parking on Another Man's Nickel. Just shows you how far, uh, how far back that went, because in Atlanta it costs about three bucks to park for an hour now. But his reference was the fact that in parking spaces, if someone left the meter running, you could park there for free and without having to pay anything. His point that he tried to make is that those of us who were born into this free land where someone else has paid the price of blood, sweat, and tears, it's so easy for us to enjoy our good fortune without taking any responsibility. Our good fortune includes the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of assembly, the right to vote and to run for office, the right to travel throughout the United States without being checked at the state borders, the right to a legal system. What wonderful freedoms and rights we do enjoy. But how often do we chafe at our duties and obligations and responsibilities? When we obey the laws that we like and are in our favor, but not the laws that we don't like. Or every April 15th when we pay the taxes to defend the country. And with the right to vote becomes, I think, a duty to vote, even though you're not required to vote. And then the one that we all complain about, serving on jury duty. Oh, I hear it all the time from you people. Oh, man, what can I do to get out of jury duty, you know? Well, you should go and serve. When it comes to this time of year, when we think about the 4th of July, when we, when we sing these God and country songs that are so deep and bred in our hearts and lives, I always think about my privilege as the citizen of this great nation. But as I think about that, I'm always thinking about another citizenship that I have that is actually prior to my citizenship in the nation. Not prior as in birth, but prior as in my allegiance. Namely, I am a citizen of God's kingdom. Now, churches always have gone back and forth about patriotic services. I know Reverend Adams has probably gone through this as well in his churches about do you wave the flag or you don't wave the flag. Sometimes our patriotic services give us an opportunity to be thankful, an opportunity to recognize veterans, an opportunity to build relationships between the church and the community, an opportunity to lift up the ideals of freedom. But on the other hand, we have churches who want to make sure that they can be the prophetic voice of the flaws of our nation. In fact, the prophets of the Old Testament spoke mainly against God's own people, God's own nation, and trying to correct them in their own lives. Probably one of the reasons it's so difficult to uh, disentangle our citizenship in America with our citizenship with the kingdom of God is that both kingdoms have as their primary focus the themes of freedom. Now, they're, they're different, though, because in God's kingdom, our freedom is not so that we would serve ourselves. Our freedom comes so that we are free to serve God and to serve others. But also the theme of responsibility, I think, comes along with both of these kingdoms. The kingdom of God is essential, and it is of high importance. If you go back to listen to Jesus, well, to read Jesus' first sermon, he is there quoting, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. The kingdom of God is his first sermon. And all those beautiful parables and stories that he told are about what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field. The kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price, and so on and so forth. But no better place does he give us the, the, the importance of the kingdom than he does when he teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Kingdom and will are tied together forever in this prayer. 
Wherever God's will is done, there is the kingdom. And whenever the kingdom is, you'll find people doing God's will. And Jesus embodied this himself in his own life. That this kingdom of God is so important. So how do we become citizens of the kingdom of God? Well, it's very much different from the kingdom, our citizenship in America. No one is born into God's kingdom. There is not one of us who is a natural born citizen of God's kingdom. Not one of us has the privilege of simply being granted citizenship because we happen to be born on some holy soil or we are born to Christian parents. No, it is only by the grace of God. Even when we baptize our young infants of Christian families, we're not proclaiming that this baby is now a Christian because of their parents, but only because of the grace of Jesus Christ. That Jesus had already died for this child's sin. And one day he will claim that for him or herself. In Romans chapter 8, Paul said, Those who live according to their sinful nature will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live and the Spirit of God will make you sons and daughters of God. You become citizens of God by the grace of Jesus Christ. The second thing about the kingdom of God and our citizenship in it is that along with this grace comes some high obligation. There is a high test citizenship in the kingdom of God. Paul says that wherever we have that obligation, it is not to our sinful natures to live according to it, but as children's joint heirs with God and joint uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then that phrase that you have to remember comes next. If indeed we share in the sufferings of Christ in order that we might share in his glory. The benefits of the kingdom of God come to us as we also serve Jesus Christ. As a part of this church, we see an obligation to make Christ known to our community and across the world by inviting people to worship with us. To invite them to understand and to experience the grace of Christ. We do this through caring for one another, by maturing in our discipleship, celebrating worship together, and also serving and being a witness to Jesus Christ. That is the high obligation of this citizenship in the kingdom of God. But perhaps covering all of this is that the kingdom of God is about love. Not just shallow love, but that deep agape love, where we love others before we love ourselves. I see this in a conversation that Jesus had with one of the scribes or the teachers of the law. In Mark chapter 12, this conversation with Jesus seems to be one in which the scribe is actually seeking to have a deeper understanding of who Jesus was and the kingdom that he was proclaiming. Because as they come together, as it's recording in Mark chapter 12, the scribe is asking Jesus what he thinks is the greatest commandment of the Old Testament. What is the greatest commandment? Now we know that Jesus kind of gives him not one answer, and not two, he gives him three answers. He says, first of all, the Lord God is one. And then the next thing you need to know is that we need to love God with all of our heart and our mind and our strength and our soul. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And this is why I think that this teacher of the law was really trying to find where Jesus was coming from. Because he says, teacher, you're so right there. In fact, it is correct that God is one and that we need to love God with all we have and that we need to love our neighbor as oneself because all of this, he says, this is the teacher of the law now, all of this is greater than the sacrifices and all the burnt offerings together. And Jesus looks at him and he says, you're not far from the kingdom. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Perhaps that's the idea that Paul had when he wrote to the Gentiles in Ephesus. Once you were a people far off from the kingdom, you were foreigners, strangers, excluded from the covenants of God. 
but because Christ preached peace to you and to those who are near, you have been brought together as one body through the blood of Jesus Christ, which makes us citizens of the kingdom of God. It's helpful for me to think about this following imagery when I think about the citizenship that we share as, as a part of the kingdom of God. Whenever we go overseas or to another country, what, what do you need to carry? Your passport, correct? And you don't want to ever get separated from your passport. Believe me, this happened to me in France. <laughs> when you go overseas, your passport represents that you are an American citizen. And even though you might be in a, on foreign soil, we take our citizenship with us. And so it is that we, as a part of Christ's kingdom, we can live in this world, but yet this world is not our home. As Paul would say later, our citizenship is in heaven. A place that we haven't gone yet, but we have a piece of it here in this world. We are citizens of another kingdom, even though we've never set foot in that kingdom. And yet, that kingdom to come is a kingdom that is here. Here when God reigns in our hearts. It is here when Jesus Christ rules our minds. That kingdom is present when the Holy Spirit controls our will and sways our desires to follow God. We're going to celebrate in a big way today our nation, the kingdom of this earth, if you will. But let us never forget that our true citizenship, our eternal citizenship, belongs in Christ, belongs to God, and we are asked to serve. We are made citizens by grace. It's a gift, folks. But then there's a high responsibility. As we enjoy the fruits of this grace let us be sure that we tend to the tree of grace and love of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Holy God, this has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.